The title of the presentation, they said it couldn't be done. So I think I should actually give you a bit of a, a sort of background to um, why I had to do it and why people said it couldn't be done. Um, I'm a computer science grad from 1981, yes, a long time ago. And I spent most of my career working for the big banks, Lloyds Bank, Standard Chartered, UBS in Zurich, ABN AMRO, RBS, and AIB. And one day, I came to the conclusion that banking was broken. And the best thing to do was to start from scratch and found a bank. And in January 2014, I started the process of applying for a banking license and raising money to start a bank. But unlike others, and there are very, very few, what was important to us was that we would write the technology from scratch. We would actually have an engineering-led organization that would create something very different and very innovative in this space. So we set out to do something that was hard. And today, four years later, and yesterday we celebrated our one year in the App Store, we have a bank based in the cloud that actually has six-digit customer numbers, a business account, a B2B proposition for the largest banks and governments in the world. And we have created that very fast in a very innovative way. So what I'd like to do today is talk about why we had to do it and how we did it. Back in January 2014, I went to the regulators, the PRA and the FCA in the UK, and said we were going to build a new bank based on cloud technologies. And they said, we don't do that sort of thing. Um, we would directly connect to payment schemes. And people said, that's rather difficult. And we we're going to build the technology from scratch and not buy packaged software. And people said it couldn't be done. And for two years, investors said it couldn't be done. Two years in, we raised the money. And one of the reasons we raised the money was a number of people, a number of firms got together to back this vision. People believed that it was possible to create something very different. So today, we're a bank on your mobile, created for people who live their lives in the smartphone. And that's people from 18 to 88. We have direct connectivity to all the payment schemes, including faster payments in the UK, SEPA, Target 2 in Europe. And we are growing every day, delivering more services to business customers, retail customers, and B2B. But if I look back what is going on, in middle of 2014, end of 2014, we had this vision. And I went around the world asking people to help me build a new bank. And one day, I'll tell you the story of how I met a tech billionaire in the States and explained the vision to him. And he said it couldn't be done. But people knew that building something from scratch in an engineering-led organization was how we should do it. So what actually happened? Middle of 2015, some people heard of our proposition and got together to build this bank. Um, the story was that in, I was quite keen that we would actually develop in a very, uh, very agile way. We would give engineers the freedom to pull together propositions in a new and innovative way. I knew from my career, when I'd led thousands of people in technology functions, 
that of every 100 million spent, 99 million was spent on committees, governance, planning, contingency, and the one or two million was actually spent in coding. So everybody at Starling really has a focus on building. So word went out that this was this woman that was going to start a bank. And a couple of people approached me and said, we've heard of this vision, we'd like to be part of it. And those people committed to the proposition, you know, before we raise money, before we've been paid to build a bank like no other. And here comes Steve Newson. <laughs> So uh, back in 2000, well, September 2015, um, I got a phone call from John Mountain. John Mountain is our current CTO, CIO. Um, he and I have been friends for quite some time, so uh, probably longer than I care to imagine. Um, but he phoned me up. He said, I'm, I'm here with a, with a group of people I've met, uh, basically Anne and a number of other people. And what, well, what they're basically trying to do is build this bank from scratch. Um, he said, I'd like. Uh, it, they, they seem like they have the right ideas, they've got a lot of plans, they've written a lot of documentation, they've uh, met the right people, they've got agreement from everyone. But they haven't actually written a line of code yet, and they haven't got any servers, and they haven't got anything running whatsoever. Um, at which point he realized he was pretty much out of, his, out of his depth on his own, and he needed to get some help. So he said to me, can you come over? Do you think you can give me a hand with this? And I was like, well, that sounds like an interesting proposition. It sounds like an interesting challenge, right? It's like, it's not very often you get the opportunity to take absolutely nothing and turn it into a completely new, a new proposition. Particularly when you've been spending this, uh, your career like I have in a number of organizations where there's lots of legacy and lots of infrastructure that already exists and you've got a complete clean slate. You can fix all those problems that you had before the, in other organizations uh, and you can use new techniques that you've found. You can use all those things you've been telling everyone that you absolutely want to do and you absolutely should be doing. You can actually, actually do that yourself. Actually, what, what John uh, did when he, when he said to me that this is the first point was... telling the truth, Steve. What yeah, he, okay. he said to me, um, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think this is... I think this is actually a very hard problem. He said, Steve, I don't think it's possible. And the main reason he did that was because he knew that that was like a red rag to a bull to me, which meant that I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely going to do it. And pretty much that evening, I was like, right, the first thing I'm going to do is build this damn thing. So we spent, uh, between us, we then spent some degree of time doing this, and we put it all together. So uh, what did we build? Well, uh, pretty much at the time when we were looking at this, there was a lot of, uh, there was this kind of start of a lot of things that were coming up in organizations, particularly banks. Um, they were talking a lot more about agile transformation. They were talking about uh, uh, digital transformation and various things like that, and cloud migration. And this was all the buzzwords. These were the things that they really wanted to be able to do. And they're still talking about this to this day, to different degrees. But certainly at that time, they were talking a lot about it. And what the problem was, was they were really um, addressing a, a problem that exists in that organization, which was not that, uh, that necessarily they didn't have the technology, so much as they'd spent a large amount of their time at these banks today building systems that just didn't support this kind of thing. Um, and that all these minor little tiny changes they were doing to their organizational structure at the bottom, at the engineering level, were not paying dividends across the entire organization because the rest of the organization, organization wasn't bought into it. The engineers were saying, you should do it this way, and the business was just going, well, we'll just carry on doing it the way we've always done it before because that's what we do. Um, so what we looked at when we were doing this was saying, well, we should, we should think about this, right? We, we want to make sure that this statement is true for us and that everything we've done since then has been, trying to, it's been an effort to make sure that we definitely don't have their problems, i.e. the big banks. We don't have those issues. We have different issues, definitely, but we don't have those issues. Right, so actually, it's not strictly true. So when I said that we went, to a, we went to AWS or we went into the cloud, we didn't actually on day one. On day one, it existed uh, on John and my laptops and GitHub. That was pretty much the only place it ever existed. And we were building that over the course of you know, weeks and months. 
So probably for the first two or three months, I think there wasn't anything at all. There wasn't a server, there wasn't any kind of infrastructure. But it became very apparent to us that at that point, we needed to be moving into the cloud. We didn't want to manage infrastructure. I didn't want to manage, manage a, a, a whole data center full of hardware. Um, firstly, I have limited experience in doing that. Um, I, have in, I can understand how to deploy servers, I understand how that works, but actually the physical wiring and all that kind of stuff, that's not really my specialty, and it's certainly not John's. So we didn't want to get into that, and we didn't think we could innovate in that area. We didn't think the organization as a whole would be able to be, would be progress quickly and in an agile fashion if we spent a large amount of time racking up machines. So AWS was a natural solution for us on this. Steve, I think it's worth point, pointing at this point. When we were talking to the regulators about doing this, most of the time they were saying to us that we cannot put a fully regulated bank, especially a bank that's providing retail banking services, um, in AWS. So it was whilst this was being done that we were still having meetings with the regulators trying to, yeah. trying to explain how all these things work. It was, a, it was, a, it was the process of, of bringing you know, the, the, um, the regulators with us through this process. Absolutely. The, regu the regulators, are, and I'll come back to the regulator a little bit later on, uh, not because I have any, any concerns about the regulator, because they're a fantastic group of people. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it was a massive challenge for us. It always has been. In fact, I think a lot of large organizations have challenges with the, with the regulator and auditors because they're also set in those same kind of uh, settings. They're used to deploying software in exactly the same architectures. And they, if they don't see the same pattern everywhere, well, then they don't, they don't know how to deal with it, don't know how to respond to it. Actually, it's quite telling. When we, when we uh, first got our auditor in to talk to us about uh, to, to, about what, he was, what they wanted to do. We did that first audit. At that point, we had a whole load of stuff in AWS. We actually weren't live fully with all our customers. We only had a few of our internal staff. But they asked us the usual sort of things, a number of questions. One of the questions on there was, who has the keys to the server room? I think we put Mr. Bezos was the uh, response on that, on that particular <laughs> thing at that point in time. Um, but uh, pre pretty much, we're always in that situation. We have to, we have a lot of challenges in that kind of area. Okay, um, so since uh, despite our team growing, which it has done, I mean, there was just two of us sitting in a, <laughs> sitting in a room over in uh, well, St. Giles High Street, I think, at the point in time. Yeah. But, um, uh, we've grown probably, we've got about 40 developers in our team, uh, software engineers generally, and that's kind of everything from infrastructure kind of specialists all the way through to uh, traditional kind of mobile developers and, uh, and Java developers and various other, other platforms. Um, we've grown relatively quickly as a team, but we've tried to keep our ethos pretty much the same. We basically want to make sure that there is no separation between IT, the traditional IT, and the business, which you get in a large or larger organizations. We consider technology to be a, a critical part of what we deploy. Actually, our, we are a technology company. We're, we just have a bank as our product, right? The banking is the product itself. We want to make sure that. Um, that continues as we grow, and that's, that's quite a challenge to some degree, but also it's about hiring people that also fit into that, making sure that we keep that ethos going, and that has to go throughout the organization and has to be brought into that right from the outset and has been brought into it right from the outset, about seeing that the value of that is, is useful to the company. And she's seeing, I think, believe you're seeing di dividends when we, when we, paying dividends when we do this because we're deploying software rapidly, we're deploying reliable software, we're actually getting features out quickly despite not having traditional kind of siloed architecture, siloed team structures and, and a business model. We've also been looking at things like making sure that we're bringing um, uh, things like continuous delivery and various other things that come from other, other technologies. Um, in reality, nothing that we're doing in these environments is particularly different to large technology organizations and, in fact, startup technology organizations out there right now. Um, we're, doing, you know, we're doing things like continuous delivery, we're doing agile development processes, we're deploying into production on a regular basis. We do one to three, at the moment average about one to three production releases of our platform every day. We're doing that during the day. Uh, we're not taking a, well, we'll just wait until the weekend and we'll do that on a monthly release process. And that's, that's related to, uh, in, in these kind of figures we're talking about here, we're so, saying a relatively high volume of, trans, of, of change within our system. And we do that all without having any outages, any kind of downtime of our system. And our system is built right from the outset to allow us to do that. And AWS, to some, to some degree, gives us that functionality. It's giving us the support mechanisms to be able to deal with that. And what we're learning from is other technology companies 
things like places like Netflix, that kind of company, yeah, where they're building those kind of same techniques into their infrastructure, and we're building the same thing. Um, actually, what we've ended up doing is, is turning that infrastructure, that kind of the process, the business process of releasing software into production, completely on its head. We're, we're making it much more, rather than being a top-down architecture, a top-down structure where you've got a load of uh, kind of project managers and release managers and architects and solution architects and all the other various names for all these senior levels of management in the organization, we decided that it was quite important to make it that the engineer that did the code change was the person that was putting it into production. And in fact, that person shepherds their change all the way from the point when they make that code change on their laptop to the point when it arrives in a production system. And if there's a problem with that production system at that point in time, it's their responsibility to maintain that system and make sure it's working correctly. And we do that by either, by some degree, allowing people to own their own parts of the infrastructure, uh, either as a team or as an individual, own parts of the infrastructure, and to be able to deploy that on their own schedule, on their own timelines, and understand what's going on. This is one of the things we use here. We actually do a, a, a we use Slack as our communication channel. It's quite, it's quite popular in a lot of organizations, uh, certainly a lot of startups these days. Um, uh, I use this slide, and uh, Tom always likes the fact his face appears multiple times on it. Um, but essentially what we do is we put in Slack whenever any code changes are going, any release is happening, someone takes an ownership of the general release, in this case, Tom. Um, and then we get everybody to comment on the commits that are going into that. We get a list of each of those changes, and people have to agree at the point when that change is about to go into life that they are happy for their change to go into production and confirm that they think that they are on the hook to support that going through production at that point in time. In fact, while I've been stood in here, we've had a release go out, and that release had that go on. I picked up on my phone while I was sat down here. That showed up a whole list of people that had done their development that, uh, in the last two or three hours, and that that's gone into line. Interestingly, those code changes probably have only been in existence in our code base, in our environment, for between one and maybe three hours. We, depending on what we've changed, we might find that we're actually getting quite a high churn rate. Um, this reflects, uh, to some degree, the same kind of information uh, for, uh, that I was saying earlier on. But the other thing to note on here is uh, mobile phones. Mobile phones, well, you can't really release an application to, uh, uh, end to the customers every three times a day. You pretty much get a bit annoyed if every time you open your phone and say, I've got another update for your banking app. Um, so we're kind of restrained in that. We'd love to be able to release more often. And in fact, the way we build our software internally is pushing out releases almost continuously. So we're, I'm getting a demo version of their application. That gets updates and deployed to on a re regular basis, uh, usually daily, maybe once or twice a day. Uh, whereas our production system, more like fortnightly, sometimes weekly, depending on what, how we're doing with each of the things. A more important thing about what goes into those releases is that we don't realistically think about, we don't actually think about plans. We don't go, right, we are going to put into this release a particular feature and this release in another particular feature and so on and so forth. And we're certainly not got a series of project managers with Gantt charts trying to work out how things are all going to string together. Actually, we don't have, we don't have estimates. We don't have budgets. Uh, we don't have any of those kind of milestone targets we have to do. And I don't, I don't press our developers to come up with those estimates and plans, what I want them to do is pick what they're going to do. I want them to understand what the business wants, how the business is going to deliver it, and how that's actually going to get into production. Critically, that engineer now needs to understand actually the business requirement. So rather than being sitting at their laptop and just getting a, you know, essentially working with an in and out tray, I get a piece of paper that tells me, do this coding. They do the coding, they put it in an out tray, and somebody else takes it somewhere else. What we've done is said, right, your responsibility is to, I need to go and do a particular piece of functionality, go and find the person that, needs, that understands that best, sit with them, design what you're going to do, build it, deploy it, support it in production. This is very different to large organizations, large, certainly large legacy banks that we're talking about. So how do we do that with the back end? Well, none of this stuff on this list, as I've said before, is actually new. It's not, it's not innovative of its, own, of, its, of its own self, right? 
there's, there's a huge list of things on here. There's a, if you were to look at um, things like uh, Netflix presentations, people like Uber, various other organizations like that, they're all talking about very similar things. They're talking about Docker, they're talking about container management, they're talking about chaos engineering, that kind of chaos monkey system that's going out and basically killing servers in production. We're not, in, we're not building new things in that area. In fact, we don't want to build new things in that area, but we are taking those technologies. We are using those technologies to base, base our entire system on and to ensure that our system is reliable. Right? We take the hit every day. Chaos engineering is a classic example of this. It's fantastic. Um, most organizations consider their, kind of their systems to be uh, very fragile. You know, they look at them and they go, they must be up the whole time. I cannot possibly touch this. I mean, you be very, very careful about that. We flip that on the head. We take that kind of Netflix attitude of saying, let's, let's work out. Let's, have, let's see if we can make how the things are going to break by just breaking them, right? We just kill servers in production. We, we just uh, turn off databases and watch them fail over into our other environment. And we don't do that ourselves. We don't go and say, right, I'm gonna come up with a plan and I'm gonna do my DR, my disaster recovery plan and quarterly we all go through, sit down, go through that plan and say, right, do this, do this, see how we do it. What we actually do is get a system to just do it for us all the time. But we're in disaster recovery pretty much constantly. That sounds terrible, actually, now I think about it. Okay. <laughs> um, but that's the way it works, right? Uh, we also do things about practicing incident response and also taking, and the, um, we use a system called PagerDuty, which you may have heard of. Um, actually, the, the, the guys are here today. Um, that allows us to do uh, send uh, messages to our engineers. And again, it's all about those same people being on call, those same people being shepherding software from the code, from the point when they do the commit into production. The engineer that did the original code is on call. They're going to be, their phone is going to ring in their pocket in the middle of the night, or well, maybe not in their pocket, but certainly on, the, on their bedside table in the middle of the night, telling them that there's a problem with a particular system. And monitoring in our systems is, is critical to make sure that we know that's the case. Um, they're also incentivized in that case to make sure their system is, is uh, uh, safe and secure in order to minimize the instances when they get woken up in the middle of the night. And we practice that on a regular basis. So what, uh, this is all fantastic. It's very easy to stand here and say, we do fantastic things, we're amazing, and you should all be exactly like us. Well, yes and no. There's bits and pieces that we don't do. There's bits and pieces we made decisions back in 2016, which, mm, well, in light of current technologies, perhaps we wouldn't have made those decisions now. But we did make them, and we made them for very good reasons. And we sent, we'd, particularly things like Terraform and Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a fantastic uh, container management system. Um, Terraform is very good at uh, being able to provide us with a provisioning of systems. We didn't pick those things at that point in time. We didn't use them at the time, mainly because, well, actually, they weren't particularly production ready, I think. Uh, and we wanted to be in a situation that we were going to be making something that was abs we absolutely were confident in building, and we were absolutely confident was going to work when we deployed it. Um, I think what's going to happen going forward is we're going to start moving into those environments. We've certainly started building out, doing initial things with Kubernetes. AWS has their uh, EKS environment, um, and we may well take some of that. We've also been building some of that stuff internally ourselves uh, to try it out using things like Minikube to be deployed on our own laptops. Uh, Terraform is something we would move to. Right now, we're using CloudFormation. I'm quite happy with CloudFormation to some extent, though when you get to scale, I think that the scale we're at, um, I think it's a bit more of a problem for us because uh, we're managing a large amount of files that are not quite so mutatable. And perhaps those decisions we made earlier on, not necessarily the right decision. But it deploys perfectly well, works very well for us, and we understand it well. So we're quite happy to stick with it for the time being. We're using other bits of technology in there. Uh, we talked about, I mentioned briefly monitoring. We have to build out a lot of monitoring in our systems. It's critical for a production system that you understand what's going on. And that monitoring, we use Prometheus. We use, we use a little bit of a log scraping to some degree. Uh, and we're using things like Grafana and other technologies in there. The only other thing to mention on this, I talk about a bit about technology in here, but more important than anything else, I think, in our organization uh, is team structure. It's really very important for us to be able to mutate our teams and reconfigure them as we see fit. 
Um, this is kind of unusual. I think the, the point here is that at the outset, we didn't know. When there was just two of us, it's really easy to run, two developers, it's really easy to run that team. You just basically segregate between the two, and you know what each other are doing. As you get larger, you get larger, more number of engineers, and you get more functions within the organization, it's harder for you to be able to just allow that to happen. But we don't know what the right structure is. We didn't know at the outset what it was. We didn't have a plan that said that this is the way it should be. And we certainly weren't going to go and say, well, all other banks do it this way, so you know, they couldn't be wrong. Let's do it exactly the same. So instead, we went down the route saying, well, let's be a bit more flexible. Let's make our, engine, make our teams understand that, it's, that they're going to have some degree of change. But what we'll give them in response to that is, the, is in, in return for that decision, is reduce the amount of overhead they get. Avoid timesheets, avoid budgets, avoid estimates, and all those things that are really there to be able to provide management control, and very little about control for the developer or the engineer themselves. They don't see a huge amount of benefit from it, yet they get all of the cost. Um, so we try to reconfigure teams on a regular basis. We do, we've done it uh, probably about five, there's been mm, five or six changes of which two or three have been significant, I think, in terms of the organization. We did it a couple of weeks ago. We restructured. And primarily that restructuring was to allow us to go and say, I want to deliver software in a very different, different types of software. We want to be able to move into different markets. We're wanting to do different bits of functionality, some of which is super, super secret. And I couldn't possibly say why Alan is here, because <laughs> kill me. Um, but there is a lot of new stuff we want to do. And what we've decided is to restructure our teams according to that. And I think it's important to allow that to happen. And once people get used to it, they, get, they kind of get over the, kind of the initial, uh, but my desk has moved. I'm not in the same place. That's kind of another interesting part of, I guess, in this reconfiguration is about um, moving desks and that kind of stuff. We've also taken, by doing in AWS and by putting everything, our entire infrastructure in AWS, we don't actually have a data center. We don't have uh, a server room. We don't have anything. We've moved offices uh, in the time we've been, that I've been in the company maybe three or four times to various different locations. And every time, it's literally a matter of taking the laptop you already have in your bag and a couple of monitors and moving them to another location. There's no physical infrastructure there. I often say that you could run the business from Starbucks. Again, the regulator really gets upset when we say that we're going to run the business <laughs> from Starbucks. But generally speaking, we could do it. Yeah. Um, and it's important. And that actually fades, comes back into teams, because it means the teams themselves can be involved in that from wherever they are. We have more flexibility. We're not doing a nine to six. We don't have to do in the office. We don't have to have physically have everybody present. And a lot of the benefits of using things like Slack and various other communication technologies uh, is that the physical presence is not necessarily that useful. However, having an office is genuinely very useful. And physical presence of teams and having people close to each other is really important. Um, and certainly, we found that in, that in most of our problems we have to solve, it's useful just physically to get everyone sat in a room together, at least for a short period of time, uh, right at the outset, at least. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to, to mention at the end of this is um, uh, was a thing that we do. We, we, we do a couple of things when we go through this. One of the things we I talked about Slack and the fact that we publish various bits and pieces. One of the things we did uh, every time our developers uh, release a production release, again, Tom Beresford, top left hand corner there with his uh, picture of Rolly McRollface. McRollington, sorry, Molly McRollington. Um, uh, whoever is doing it basically says they're rolling the production release. And this is a good way for us to be able to announce to the entire organization, not just the engineering team, but everybody, that that code release is going. And it's usually associated with, I literally have no idea how this happened, but uh, with a GIFI image on Slack. And there's an assortment of GIFs that we end up doing. Um, actually, as it says on there, our, uh, our auditors really, really liked this, which was odd, because I thought they didn't have a sense of humor. But apparently, they do. Um, they, saw, they saw this as very, a, a much more clear, so like I say, a clear signal uh, that we are involved in that release and we know what's going on. And it was an excellent way and a very simple way for us to be able to announce to the organization that change was happening. It also allows us in that situation for, some, for other parts of the organization to go, wait, hang on a second. We don't want to do a release. We can't do a release because there is some other thing that's going on that is really important. It could be there is a really important meeting that's happening. We want to demo something. It could be that Anne is stood at a presentation here, and she's about to demo it on the phone, or she's about to demo some functionality, and she doesn't want that to happen. In reality, rolling is genuinely 
not really a huge issue for us, or it certainly hasn't been, because we've had so much experience of doing it. We've done so many releases to date that it just becomes a matter of course. I'll hand you back to Anne. Okay. Standing at the lectern, I've managed to recognize quite a few people in the audience. Uh, and I've actually spotted you, so on the way out, please wave, whatever, and get my attention. Um, and some of you have actually worked for me in my old technology roles at big banks. Um, I've had some big technology jobs. You know, I was CTO for AN um, across 55 countries. I've had big CIO jobs. And most of the things I knew and believed was actually wrong. I spent 30 years offshoring, outsourcing, change managing, and going to meetings. And when I went into the financial crisis, we all studied how we're going to put the banks back together the way they were before the crisis. But I had the opportunity of spending a short period of time in fintech. After leaving RBS and before joining AIB. And all of a sudden, I found that people were building things and delivering businesses and giving things customers really want, spending 30,000 or 300,000. And that same thing would cost me 30 million in a big bank. Could I do it any cheaper in a big bank? I couldn't. In 2011, I took the opportunity of going into AIB, Allied Irish Banks, as, as Chief Operating Officer. It sounded really good back in a big job after working in Shoreditch. Lovely office, thousands of IT staff, thousands of consultants as well, actually. Um, and we spent a lot of our time figuring out how we're going to transform the organization. And we were very, very successful. We determined and defined the best possible process. Then we set out achieving that. But I came to the conclusion if I had the best possible processes across the whole organization, I couldn't transform it. People had changed the way they bought music. People had changed the way they were shopping with Amazon. But nobody had changed the way they were going to do banking. And I was surrounded by some very, very talented people in technology departments, in offshoring organizations, in outsourced organizations. But we spent 95% of our time talking about it rather than 95% actually coding. So most of what I knew was just wrong. The whole world had changed, and I hadn't noticed. So I wanted to build a bank, a new bank. And I wanted to build it in a new way. So I started going around the world, hungry for new ideas, learning about concepts such as APIs, learning about cloud, learning about new ways, ways to do things. But I was so senior, I didn't know anybody who actually coded. I think they were somewhere in the organization, but I hadn't met them for about 10 years. And I came to the conclusion that was holding us back was all this change, management, bureaucracy, <coughs> meetings, governance. And then I met a bunch of people who were highly talented, who actually coded, who were actually were engineers. And these engineers were going to talk and really sort of deliver things. And that's how Starling was formed. But when I show people around the organization and all the big bank CEOs and CTOs and CIOs and chief digital officers and chief change officers and chief commercial officers come to see us, 
we walk around. And they say, but surely you can't run a bank this way. Surely the regulator requires this. Surely you need to do it in a different way. And you should know, Anne, you've been in those jobs. And my response is the world's changed and you haven't noticed. What we need to do is actually think of things in a whole new way. And what we've done in Starling is create an organization that doesn't have departments. There's no IT department. There's no finance department and marketing department. We're putting our brains together to create something special and deliver things. But doing what we do is more exacting and needs more measurement than any traditional organization. We're a highly engineered, highly managed, measured organization. In our office, you have a big, big screen where we monitor everything. Being agile, when I talk to the CEOs and CTOs of the biggest banks in the world, I tell them the way we do things is not about being scrappy or being startup. It's being exact. It's measuring. It's engineering. It's, it's hiring some of the best engineers in the world to deliver something that's never been done before. We're at the start of a revolution in banking. We're at the start of doing something very different. Up until now, big banks have been clustered around business models which have gone past their sell by date. Starling is all about building technology from scratch, linking into payment schemes directly, collecting lots and lots of information around transactions, using machine learning and artificial intelligence to get insight into that information, and then with the permission of the consumer or the business, sharing that data through open APIs in a marketplace with other providers. This model is revolutionary. But what I'm most proud of is how we do it, not what we do. It's about culture. It's about being brave and courageous and individuals taking accountability for their actions. Having layer upon layer of people checking and committee after committee of people signing the docs doesn't actually make better software or better decisions. So you in the audience have to make a decision, really. And I'm talking to here to the people that are in the middle. The people at the senior level looking at organizations saying, you know, what are we going to do in the future? We have the people who have engineering skills that are here sucking up everything that's going on in this organization. And then you have the people in the middle who are going to the meetings. And a future is a world without meetings. The future is a world that we measure and we move very, very fast. And I can say this to a 50-year-old CEO from another big bank. You can't say it as an engineer, necessarily, but I can say it. And at this particular point, I need your help. I need your help to spread the word. Because I may be somebody that's been in technology an awful long time. I may be a banker that's run banking businesses across the world. But I'm also an entrepreneur. And I see a whole bunch of people in front of me who could be our advocates. And I'm humble enough to ask you to help. So please download the app.
face and spread the word. I'm terribly, terribly proud of the bank we've built. And you know, if you, you know, it's, it's Darling Bank in the App Store. Go to our website, starlingbank.com. Spread the word. Follow me on Twitter. I'm quite vocal on Twitter and quite opinionated. You wouldn't be surprised. Um, um, it's, it's, it's Anne Bowden, A-N-N-E-B-O-D-E-N. But above all, I'm really proud of having built a bank from the ground up with hugely talented engineers and with the support of lots of technology companies, you know, like AWS, who have supported us to build something really, really special. Now, I've got four minutes left, and I'd really like to have some audience participation. Therefore, I am, what, you know, we don't have microphones in the audience, but you can yell out your question. And I'm prepared to answer absolutely anything. And if I don't have the answer, I got Steve. OK, question in the front. Are you looking for a branch out for retail banking? Uh, we, we, we have retail banking. We have business banking. At the moment, we have a limited company. You can have an account. If you're a contractor or a freelancer, we, we, we're ideal for you. Please download the app now. But we also have business. We have transaction banking services. And we provide um, payment services. Uh, to people like the DWP, Department of Work and Pension, we provide you to fintechs and other banks. So we are in business as well. Any other questions? Question? Yeah. Um, we have a passport into Ireland, and we are going to use Ireland to launch across Europe very soon. Question in the, in the middle? Oh, don't mention Monzo. Can okay. someone take him out, please? Um, no. <laughs> okay, we are very, very nice people. Okay, but our app, okay, you know, it, direct comparison in the marketplace, we have the most feature-rich application. We have goals for saving. We have Settle Up. We have the... I'm sorry? We've got Apple, Apple Pay, Pay. Yeah, Apple yeah, Pay. yeah. Um, we've also got lots of other app, um, Pays. So, <laughs> so I think we're far out there as the best app in the marketplace. Um, and we want to do different things and exciting things for our customers. So please let us know what you want, and we'll work on it very, very soon. And the question are right in the middle there. Oh, thank you. How big is our AWS bill? Too big. But we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we get a discount for doing this, I think. They, they haven't confirmed that yet, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. OK, next question. In the front. OK, now, this is a very, very good question. Everybody asks me, um, how are you going to stop being a legacy bank? How are you going to stop the legacy happening? A legacy comes along with being very, very successful. When we have 30, 40 million accounts, we've probably got some legacy, right? We are moving fast because we are able to start from scratch. Lots of people will come up with lots of plans for how you can prevent your system becoming legacy systems. I don't believe any of them. It's a consequence of growth. Next question. Good. Anything else? Must have oh, one question in the front. Are you hiring? <laughs> yes, we are. Okay, right. So we'd love to talk to people about joining Starling. Um, uh, we, you know, sort of. So come and talk to us. We've got a careers page going out there. Uh, please connect to us. Um, we love to talk to interesting people. And working in Starling is a bit special. It's an organisation where sort of engineers are in charge, really. OK, anything else, anybody? Any, oh, one question there in the middle. The challenge. And well, the question is, the, um, just because you're a new bank doesn't mean they've actually lowered the, the requirements. You know, we have to provide the best quality services, equal and better, to all the incumbents. And the hurdles are very, very high. The issue you have with regulators is that you know, we need to explain what we're doing. And they're used to the processes looking one way. When you try to explain to people that going with small releases, very, very frequent, is safer, 
and it looks very different to other organizations, that takes some doing. But I think we have, but what reassures people is that we measure absolutely everything. And I'm terribly proud that when I explain on the board how we do things and our infrastructure and how AWS delivers for us, they're very, very impressed. Okay, I've got to zero. I, so one question, and then I'm going to shut up. Okay? One question there. Yeah, a marketplace is where we'll actually make sure our customers are the best choice of products. Um, we will, um, the marketplace um, is a wonderful concept whereby other products and other startups can link with us using PSD2 um, APIs. So, no, we're focusing on what can be done best with technology. Starling is all about transforming the financial service industry with technology. And we believe the current account and our current product set does that best. Thank you very much, everybody. And Steve? <laughs>